out to the Writers' Center on a Saturday evening for this uh, very special occasion uh, to hear Ismet Perchik, or Izzy, as he likes to be called. We found out, read from his wonderful novel, Shards, that won the uh, second um, of Laughlin Stern's um, first novel prize. Uh, I'm just here to greet you. Uh, I'm the executive director of the Writers' Center, Stuart Moss, and I'll be calling up our assistant director in a moment who will actually introduce Izzy. Um, those of you who aren't familiar with the Writers' Center, and I suspect there are probably most of you who are, this is a literary community. We, uh, we offer writing workshops here, about 300 a year. Uh, we have author readings almost every Sunday and Saturday. Uh, tomorrow, in fact, we're doing a program called Interlinear, which is four local poets, each of whom writes in a different language. And they're going to be reading their poetry in the original language and then reading a translation into English, so it should be very interesting. Please come out for that. It's 2 o'clock tomorrow, uh, and it's free and open to everybody. So I think with that, uh, I will turn the microphone and lectern over to Sunil Freeman, who will introduce Izzy. Thank you, Stuart. Um, before I introduce uh, Izzy, first thing, I'd like to um, invite everybody to silence your cell phones, if you would, please, and I'll Remember to remind you to turn them back on again uh, after the reading. Um, Izzy will be happy to sign books too after the reading as well, and we'll have a reception. I'm tremendously honored to uh, introduce Ismet Persik uh, at the Writers' Center. Uh, he was born in Tuzla, uh, Bosnia Herzegovina, in the year 1977. In 1996, he immigrated to the United States. He has an MFA from the University of California Irvine campus, and he's a recipient of a NEA Award in Fiction in 2010. Um, his initial first novel, debut novel, Shards, which we're celebrating today as winner of the, the second winner of the McLaughlin Eston Stern's first novel prize, has received very widespread acclaim. Um, some of the places include it was a New York Times Notable Book of the Year, a Chicago Sun Times Best Book of the Year, an Oregonian Top Ten Northwest Book of the Year. She was shortlisted for the Pacific Northwest Booksellers Association Book Award and the Flaherty Dunn First Book Award, First Novel Prize winner of the Sue Kaufman Prize for Friction and winner of the Los Angeles Times uh, Art Swedenbaum Award. In addition to his work as a novelist, he's very active as a filmmaker. Um, and in, uh, he uh, co-wrote a screenplay for a feature-length film with Malik Vidal, which was one of the projects selected for the Sundance Institute Screenwriters Lab. Um, as I was looking at all the very insightful and very heartfelt uh, tributes to this book and comments on it, um, I felt like I was in a jewelry store. There were just so many things that you could say from people who admired this first novel by Izzy Persig. And um, it was like, do I pick this one to say, or do I pick that one or that one? And uh, I finally thought something that Brad Watson said describing this novel really struck home. He says, Ismet Persick's prose is a gleaming pinball kept in inexhaustible play, kinetically suspended in time and space, endlessly flung away from its inevitable ending, colliding with memory and invention. This writing, this is writing fed by skill, inertia, horror, and sorrow, a survivor's story of triumph and guilt. Yet Persick's sensibility is at once brutally and tenderly comic. Humanity seems to run deepest among those who have survived its near absence in the world. We're very honored at the Writers' Center. Please welcome. Hello. <clears throat> Hello. Uh, I'm gonna read uh, from the book, and since it's since the book is called Shards, I'm gonna read three separate uh, little pieces. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, three separate pieces that are kind of written in different styles, just to kind of give you a sense of um, you know what it sounds like. Um, so they're naughty words too. So. Uh, I think the first thing that I want to read is, um, I was just telling somebody, uh, when uh, I grew up in theater in Bosnia, and uh, it's really easy to do theater, because you put on somebody else's clothes, and you speak somebody else's words, 
and yes, you use your own face, but still, you know, it's somebody else. So it's really easy to do this when you're, you know, writing, you know, reading your own thing, and um, you know, sitting, standing in your own face and in your own clothes. It's a little daunting. Um, so I apologize if I start, you know, breaking down. Look at my, my hands are kind of shaking. Um, so I'm going to read um, from early in the book, um, from the chapter called "Some Early Sorrows." Here we go. Earliest memory. Hot summer day. My grandmother brought a hatchet from the shed and hung it on the branch of a, thin, of, of a thin cherry tree in the backyard, smiling. I sat on a sheepskin rug in the shade of a rose bush, watching a hand trying to flee, flipping its white wings, one of its yellow talons tied by rope to a stake driven into the middle of the lawn. It would get a meter or so into the air and then anchored, flap back down. For a second, it would stand there balancing on one foot, blinking, cocking its head sideways, and then it would try again. When grandmother approached, it went crazy, flying around in a whirlpool of airborne feathers. The sound of the wings was deep and muffled, like glove-handed applause. Grandmother sneered as she stepped on the rope closer and closer to the hand, gradually uh, reducing its fly zone. Finally, she cut it, untied the rope, and with a wide-eyed hand, under, under her left arm, took the hatchet off the cherry branch and walked behind the shed. I got up and waddled up to her, but she heard me and, uh, and yelled at me not to look. I stood around the shed's corner for some time, not moving, then peeked out anyway. I saw her kneel down on the bird, trying to subdue its wings, trying to get a good grip on it, so she could place its head on a low stump in the clearing full of sawdust and wood chips. Her back was to me, so she couldn't see me. The first thwack of the hatchet missed completely. The second was weak and hit too close to the thick of the breast and didn't do much. The third connected with the neck but failed to sever the head. The fourth one took the head off all right, but my grandmother lost a grip on the hand and it took off flying for four or five meters, landing in the grass right in front of me. It took a couple of steps and stretched its wings as if thrilled with itself that it got away. That it got away. Its neck spurted blood that reddened its white plumage something awful, but that seemed not to be an issue. It fluffed its feathers, getting some specks of blood on my bare legs, then sc scratched the grass with its feet, leaned down, and obeying a terrible instinct somewhere in its muscles, made as if to feed, as if to pack the ground with its beak that was meters away on a small dune of blood-sprinkled sawdust already stilled by death. I'm going to skip some ages here and go and read age 12, uh, which is hopefully a little funnier. Um, age 12. In elementary school, I was into math. I liked that there was only one solution per problem, that nothing was vague, that you didn't have to interpret what the author meant by this or that. I had it all figured out for the first four years. It was later, as the math got more abstract and elusive, and you had to remember formulas and draw coordinate, coordinate systems and such, that I developed animosity towards the subject. Suddenly, there was more than one solution to a single problem, and I started to lose my footing in reality as I knew it. I remember being obsessed with the notion that a straight line can go on forever and never touch another straight line that was parallel to it, that seen from the side, a straight line is just a dot, which I thought could not be proven, since the line would go right through your eye and brain, rendering you blind and dead. <laughs> Tragically, I said this out loud in class, and my comrade teacher thought I was trying to be funny, and made me stand in a corner facing the wall for hours. My peers snickered at the size of my ass, and I visualized myself turning into a dust mote and wafting out through the crack under the door. But mostly my change of heart came when she uh, walked into my life, my comrade teacher, Dagmila. She was a plump brunette in her 40s, with pleasant features and nicely manicured nails, but with some kind of growth in her cheek that allowed her to smile with only one side of her mouth, making the effort seem cold and half-hearted. She was capable of such astonishing mercilessness that I pissed myself 20 minutes in, into the class because she wouldn't let me out because that's why we had breaks in between classes. I sat there in lukewarm dampness inside an acrid cloud thinking of comic book heroes. I stopped doing my homework. I convinced myself I couldn't get it. I faked being sick to cut class. I prayed not to be called on. I copied other students' work. By the third trimester, I had accumulated a plethora of bad grades, got caught cheating on an exam, little pieces of paper with formulas glued to the underside of my fat ruler, and was sent to the principal's office. 
The principal, who we call Rooster, because he had a piece of loose leathery skin connecting the tip of his chin to the center of his collarbone, ripped me a new one and then gave me a second chance. If I did well on the final exam, he was going to let my conduct on becoming a student slide. There was no way I could have prepared a school year's worth of math in two and a half weeks. I told myself that I was trying. In reality, most of my energy was directed at conjuring up elaborate scheme that would um, excuse me from taking the final. I fantasized about being hit by a car and lingering between life and death. I prayed for a communicable disease. I just, it just so happened that my mother had to go uh, with her nurses club to a symposium on how to battle alcoholism somewhere in Macedonia right about that time. I also take the final exam. Knowing this ahead of time and realizing that I was going to be alone with my pushover of a father, I hatched my master plan. See, a couple of years back, my cousin Adi had an inflamed appendix that needed to be taken out. Due to the operation and some complications, he didn't have to take any final exams and still passed into the next year. My plan was to find out from him all the symptoms of an appendix attack and act them out for my father in hopes it would get me under the surgical knife. In the, in the dictionary, it said that the appendix is a slender closed tube attached to the large intestine near the point at which it joins the small intestine. I had no problem sacrificing that. Not only did my father buy into my performance, but so did the doctors in the ER. I went out of my way not to blurt out a list of sim sim uh, symptoms like an amateur. I just picked a few good ones and mentioned them offhandedly. There was no empty doubling over or cries of pain. I kept my cool. It worked. By the time they got me into one of those surgery slip-ons that led me down the tiles, uh, tiled floors of pacifying mint green, to green and bleach, I did get cold feet, but it was too late. The anesthesiologist started telling me a joke and zonked me out just before the punchline. When I tell this story, I often exaggerate and say that my last thought as I, thought as I was going under was motherfucker, like I said, an exaggeration. I dreamt that my inflat inflatable raft got ruptured on some craggy rocks just under the surface and that I was about to sink into the depths where some dark shapes were sliding around. I came to in a corridor with terrible pain and a confusion of squeaky wheels and people talking and bleach and iodine. I was wheeled into a room, moved to a bed, and the boy next to me had some complications, so they left him open with a tube dripping yellow pus into a plastic container. He looked miserable. The girl on the other side of my bed was bald. She had lice, amongst other things. I remember the ravenous sounds my stomach made when they brought in food for everybody but me and the pus boy. I remember his haircut, a little like Hitler's, and the way the liquid glucose dripped down the tube and into my vein for lunch. My mom returned from Macedonia early and pulled some nurse strings to come and visit me beyond the visitation hours. She seemed to have bought my performance as well. She was there when my doctor came into the room looking more like a butcher than a doctor, with oily skin a sheen, an unshaven neck and a mustache as solid as a chocolate log. He told us that I was a very lucky boy, that if I hadn't gotten to the hospital when I did, I would have died, that the inflammation of the appendix was at such a late stage that it was full of pus and ready to burst. He then produced a jar of yellowish liquid with what looked like a fat piece of decomposing red licorice, twisted and curled. The biggest one I've ever seen, he said. That's including grown-ups. Let me get one thing across. I never, not for a single second during my performance, felt any pain. None. So, what happened? Here are some possibilities. Perhaps the doctor found a perfectly normal appendix and realized I was lying and decided to play a little joke on me. Or perhaps I got so far into the role of a boy who's having an appendix attack that I psychosomatically caused my appendix to inflame. Or maybe God found a twisted way to tell me I needed an operation when my body refused to warn me in the usual way. So what happened? Uh, realization. There is no one solution. Everything is up for interpretation. It's all about what the author meant by this or that. My mom made me go to school after missing only six days. I took the final exam, got a C. <laughs> it's only two sentences. One is very long, one is really short. Um, and it's called A Full Minute of Everything for Cyrus. It kind of captures, uh, or tries to capture, um, what it's like to have a panic attack due to post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, a Full Minute of Everything for Cyrus. 
Home sweet home and on a love seat, recline, groggy with alcohol and five day camping trip with ticks and bears and giant trees. You'll sit in a low glow of a 40 watt bulb with a journal and the TV on and the Johnny Cat is psychotically chewing his fur off and the insides of his hind legs are even more bare than when you left. And his eyes are huge and loveless and the aquarium sits half full or half empty. The fish have been moved elsewhere since it started leaking and shorted out the answering machine. And there's a week's worth of Los Angeles Times Orange County editions still in their plastic auras, unread and splotched with desert dreamscapes, broken wire fences, camouflage uniforms and mushroom clouds. And everything is a mess and clustered against the cyclorama of colorful junk mail offering junk food and junk dreams for prices a junkie could afford, are white envelopes reminding you of approaching due dates, and the lady long legs pokes her appendages at the old wine stain under the strict surveillance of the cat too lazy to get up his fat ass and hunt for his own food, and a car drives into a desert sunset on screen, and the metallic letters spell out Nissan, and then the angry young white man comes back on, his baby face wrinkled with tough attitude, his whiny voice gets bleeped a lot. And he swears by artistic expression and spits on censorship and laughs all the way to the bank. And his song bounces in the background and, you ha and your hand slips to the floor and investigates around until it finds the Kai Elua Outrigger Canoe Club mug, half full or half empty of diet orange soda and Albertson's vodka out of a plastic bottle purchased with your Discover card since your bank account said 1869 last time you checked some months ago. And the liquid goes down with painful ease and your eyes get a bit watery from all the mess around, so you press a button to change the things you can change at the moment. And the angry young white man vanishes into a representation of a faraway land on screen, with tongue-breaking names for towns split sometimes with a dash. And the south is scribbled on with red and black arrows pointing north, and the drawings of tanks and planes are harmless and look like something from the Cartoon Network. And the white-haired, white-colored white dude with a foot and a half in the grave points a pointer with a sagging hand and explains in a loveless voice what we are doing using sports rhetoric, like we hit the target and our team is easily, easily maneuverable, and we have the best team in the world, and fairy tale rhetoric of bad guys and good guys, victims and bullies, right and wrong, and somewhere across the globe, civilians are being liberated, liberated of their lives, personal property, culture, pursuit of happiness, and you press the button again as your eyes water a little bit more, and the cat licks his ass, and more liquid goes down, and you find a bump on your back, and it better not be another tick that Lyme disease shit is nothing to laugh about, and some other white-haired, white-colored, white dude talks to a handful of white-haired, white-colored, white dudes about his newest book on multicultural diversity, and you mute the sucker silent and imagine him running a marathon in sweltering heat and drinking Gatorade that turns his sweat green. And for a moment, everything is silent. Then the phone screams too loud and the cat sprints into the corridor and your mind flashes to Bosnia and to a mortar shell hitting your house, <coughs> gym, uh, high school gym and its detonation tossing you over three meters of tile floor into a pinup board and your head buzzing with a hysterical motherboard and you bar barely hearing the sirens you know are shrill. And your thoughts are comatose with the overwhelming flashback forcing itself into your awareness, re re reminding you that things might not be so peachy after all. And your heart pumps hard but offbeat. And the way the air escapes out of you without your control over it foreshadows the impending panic attack that freezes you in your tracks. And you should go and answer that phone before it rings again, screams again, but you cannot move and everything is suspended as if paused by a remote control so that the being watching you, dreaming you, inventing you on the spot can go and take a leak squeezes it out and marvel at its chiseled facial features while you wait for the crush, crushing collapse of your inner system and the ascent of baseless fear, paranoia will destroy you but it doesn't come, a false alarm and you're relieved and sweaty and only if your heart would start again and then it does and you start for the phone which screams again but this time you're ready and prepared and you put aside the remote control, get off the love seat, step over a bunch of crap and pick up the telephone. It isn't Melissa. Thank you. Well, I think the Hamlet connection came later. Uh, I grew up in theater. I was in theater since I was like six years old. Um, and, and this book is kind of like a love letter to theater. Uh, it's all about the performative nature of, of, of self. How does, you know, because if you think about it, what we are are stories that we tell first to ourselves and then to other people, right? You are you only when you're naked in the room by yourself in the middle of the night and you know every single secret that, you know, stuff that nobody else knows, not your lover, not your mother, not anybody. That's when you're you. As soon as you get out and start talking to another person, you put on makeup, you put on clothes, you want to be liked, 
you, you know, you ed edit things out of your speech, stuff that you don't say, you know, and you make sure that you know somebody very well before you're gonna tell them the deep stuff. And even then, you're still kinda like, try it out, right? You tell them a little bit and a little bit and then slowly reveal yourself in all of your disgustingness. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so I knew it was gonna be about theater, so, uh, you know, and then uh, I found that wonderful poem in the beginning, uh, I think it was the Los Angeles Times that talked about shards. Uh, you know, who broke these mirrors and tossed them shard by shard among the branches? Lakdar, the poet, must gather these mirrors on his palm and match the pieces together any way he likes and preserve the memory of the branch. Um, in other ways, um, how do you shatter a human being with an experience and then expect them to come back together exactly the way they, they were, which is what we ask our soldiers to do, which, what we ask everybody to do, really. You know, you know, mom and dad say, you can't kill people, you can't steal from them, you can't put them in jail, and then war comes and they say, okay, no, you have to kill people, you have to put, and then, you know, four years later, they go, okay, no, you can't do it, and then you're like, wait a minute, so all of this stuff is just a bunch of people agreeing that this is real? And then it shatters the, you know, it, it shatters the, the world as you know it. Because you, there's no unknowing something. There's not, no unseeing something. It's over. And then you see the puppet strings. And then you realize it's just a bunch of people believing that stuff is there, you know. Um, which is scary, <laughs> you know. Uh, so, I don't know, so Hamlet came from that before, because he was talking about shards of, of mirror that re reflect the branches of, of, you know, that's the only way, only, all we have is these little shards, little, little pieces of story when somebody dies, right? You don't know their life, but you know little stories of them and that's how, they, you know. So, and then I thought it was like, oh, because in that quote, uh, Hamlet is talking about uh, to, the, to the players and he's telling them how to act and what's the best way to act and he's saying like, um, uh, that, uh, you know, you have to hold a mirror up to nature. And I thought it was like, if I introduce the mirror first and then have the shards of mirror, I'm you know, making a connection there. Yes, it's a nicely put, usually it's like, how much of this is real? And I say, 13%. <laughs> or like 13 and a half percent, but like every time I pick a different number, because it's so arbitrary. Um, a memoir, um, when people talk about life story, it, to me, it seems like an oxymoron. You know, life is a one thing and a story is another thing. They both have beginning, middle, and end, and they're structured in that, in that particular way because we, we as humans, we, we see life that way. It starts and then we get, you know, in our 40s and then we die, whatever, in our 45s. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, so that's the only connection between the two because if you actually want to capture somebody's life, you would have to. You know, if you write somebody's life, you would have to write hours of television that they watch and hours of, of, of dreams that they have and sleep and being boring and doing nothing and having nothing happen to them. That's life. That's what life is like. You know, story has to be exciting. Something has to happen. Something has to change continuously. So, and I also don't believe that humans can, that we really have an apparatus to perceive what we, what we like to call reality. We like to believe that there is this reality that's shared by everybody, but it's, most of it is belief that it's, that it's there. All we see is just tiny little sliver of it, you know? And also, we don't have a camera. And also, our eyes are not, are, are not correct, right? We can only see 1% of the, of the visual spectrum. They're, you know, they, we might be bombarded by gamma rays right now, we wouldn't know. This place might be completely radioactive, and we would just go like, "Ooh, this is wonderful! What a wonderful, you know, evening. because we don't have the apparatus to perceive the reality." So then, if you have to believe your fallible eyes and your fallible brain and your fallible, you know, skin, even skin, you know, you say like, "Oh, I'm touching this podium; and it's real." And no, there's electrons in the surface of the stable that are repelling the electrons on the surface of my hand. And nothing is being touched, but my brain is saying, oh, yeah, there's something there. And if you have, you know, this fallible apparatus, then goes into the central system, which is obviously fallible, in the brain that perceives and filters everything through what you know from before, what you were taught, all of this stuff. 
how can you call something a real experience? You know, and they keep going like, you know, we have an eyewitness, and then they didn't see the right thing. They did these studies in which, you know, they 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 pretend there is a mugging, and they have hundred people line up waiting for some free stuff, and they have a mugging, and they ask people when they go to pick up their free stuff, what happened? And every story is different, you know. And somebody goes, it was a black man with a gun, and then they show them the tape, and it's a white dude with a beanie. You know, who just snatched the, you know, but people see things that are not there, right? So how do you then pretend to say, you know, this is a true event of, of what happened to me? And so I, I, so I kind of willfully cre uh, named the, the character in the book by, because I want, after my, my own name and my own family, because um, I wanted to trick the reader into believing, oh, you know, you're reading this, oh, it, oh it's, it's one of those like autobiographical novels, he's going to be fine by the end. I can totally read, and this will be horrible stuff in it, but I know he survived because it's his name and he's going to be fine, which is why people like to read memoirs. Um, and then I just, you know, turn the switch somewhere in the middle and you're like, by the, you know, at the end there's like, whoa, which one of them is real? Is this, whoa? And then you have no clue uh, what is real and what is not um, on purpose. So that's the, you know, I, I don't believe in, in, you know, people, I think that when we talk about memoirs, we like it so much that there's reality that we, like, confuse ourselves and we just let ourselves believe because, we, you know, we're like, oh, this is what happened to this person or, you know, this is what, you know, Abraham Lincoln was like or this is all of, well, we have no clue what was going on in their, in their heads, you know, and, uh, you know, if I do this, you can kind of sympathize, you know, you can sympathize with my pain, but you don't feel my pain. My mother loves me, and she doesn't feel this pain. My wife probably loves me, uh, you know, but she doesn't feel this pain. I'm the only person who feels this pain. And then, but for some reason, like the dumbasses that we are, human beings, we have, we're like, oh, I want to share this pain with somebody, and then what do you do? You try to put it in a book, and you try to translate it into words and symbols on a page, and then people, you know, so you can approximate the feeling of what it's like to, you know, be somebody else, so you, you're, you're not alone in the universe, and you can talk to somebody, you know, across time and space or <laughs> whatever, uh, even though it's not, we can never do it. We can never capture that pain. We can never you know, capture what it's like to be you to somebody else. We can try. You know, there's this reality, there's this nature that we live in that we will never know. But the way we're built is we have to try. And he says, ever tried, ever failed, no matter, try again, fail again, fail better. And that's the only thing we can do. We, even in science, we, we try to understand the world, you know, we, we try through religion, which is kind of uh, top down, we kind of say, oh, let's, there's something up there, and then everything else trickles that way. And science goes from bottom up, so like, what do we know, and now let's build the narrative this way. And then artists and these, you know, mystics are kind of in the middle of going, like, bridging things, like, maybe a little bit of this and a little bit of this, and let's put it, nah, and no, you know. But um, we keep failing, and we will always, kind of like Zeno's paradox, you can always break the atom into smaller and smaller pieces and find out new things that do not make sense to, you know, to what we already know. But it's not necessarily a failure if you accept that it's an error. It's only a failure if you insist on something that it can't be. Yes, I, I mean, but that's the thing. I think most, most people would like to be, you know, uh, you know, a binary kind of thinking. You like it to be zero and one. Is, it this, is this good for me or is this bad for me? And that's all I want to learn about it, right? And then when you do that, what you do is you, put, you always round up the decimal, right? Something is 0 0.8, and you say it's a 1, and I don't want to think about it anymore. It's over, it's, you know, or it's a 0 0.3, no, it's a 0, goodbye, I don't need to think about it anymore. But it's, you know, it's when you actually, like, worry about the problem, when you're studying, if you're a scientist, if you're a writer, if you're, uh, that's when you, when you go into it, you realize, oh no, this is way more nuanced than we actually, you know, and something can be both true and untrue at the same time. And how's that possible? You know, photons, the, the smallest units of light, can be both energy and matter, 
depending on how you look at them. And it's like, what is going on? Who is looking? How am I changing the physical nature of something if I'm looking at it? Where's, my, where's this power coming from, right? And then, um, yeah, so then my world, I constantly, every day, at least once or twice, I think about, why can't I walk to this wall if everything is mostly empty space? You know, between atoms, you know, it's mostly like there's nucleus and then there's a bunch of stuff, clouds of possibility of electrons of where they are. And then, you know, and then uh, reading about science, there was a great thing in, in Harper's Magazine, and they asked these amazing scientists, what is the one thing that you believe, uh, that you do not know, that you cannot prove, but you believe that it's true? And one of the scientists said that there is no time. Because if you can kind of look at it, even mathematically, who, uh, is it Einstein who said that there's no reason why we cannot remember future mathematic, mathematically. There's no reason why we're just remembering the past and going into the future. That it's, it's, it's the same thing, but for some reason we're built this way to just remember the past and to be scared of the future, you know, in order to survive. But it might be kind of like Vonnegut's uh, Slaughterhouse Five when, you know, Billy Pilgrim gets unstuck in time and he can visit any moment of his life anytime he wants. He just wakes up at his deathbed and wakes up at his birth and wakes up all over the place, which is, an, I think, a better way to look at life. You're less scared. I don't know if I want to tell you the ending. I mean, I kind of said that, you know, it's not one of those books that, you know, has a big aha thing that you're like, oh, I figured it out. There's nothing to figure out. It's, you have two parallel, um, stories of, of one Bosnian guy who, who comes to America and escapes the war and one who stays behind and then at some point they start having each other's dreams and then they start like having similar life stories and then by the end you have no clue which one of them is real and some of the stuff is written in the first person some of it is in the third person a bunch of it is in the second person which is weird but you know I think it works where, where, where it works um, but like what happens is nothing, I just confuse you. I just, you know, because the point is not to reach the end and know something. The point is to the process of learning these bits of, of, of this person. You know, if you want to meet a human being, you go meet a human being. But if, you, uh, if, if, if that person is dead, then all you can meet is stories that, that are collected. So this is kind of like shattered human being and you have stories from all over the place that might be true, that might not be true. Some of this stuff is from my own life, but I kind of on purpose put a bunch of my real stories and my real feelings into the fictional guy and then a bunch of the fictional stuff into like, the real guy. So yeah, it's all like the, the whole point is that you cannot know that it's, it's, it's about learning about this person, not about knowing what, you know, because most of the time when you when you read a book in which it, it ends and you kind of, you get it, you just put the book away and it's over, right? And, but if you don't do that, then it goes, what is this guy trying to do? What, what, ah, it's annoying and throwing, you know, but it makes you think and it, you know, and uh, so that's why. We're going to have a presentation to Uzi now as the winner of this prize. Let me just give you a little background about the prize. One of our board members, Neil Gillen, uh, started taking workshops here at the Writers' Center uh, several years ago and had three wonderful workshop leaders that really helped to mentor him and inspire him and have become great friends of his ever since. So he decided not only to recognize wonderful, innovative writers like Izzy, but also especially to honor these three individuals who had such a profound impact on him himself on Neil Gillen, and they are Anne McLaughlin, um, Lynn, uh, Bar Barbara Esmond, and Lynn Sturz. And so uh, Barbara is going to represent the group and come up and make a presentation to, to Izzy of the Prize. I was supposed to start off by thanking Neil. Um, he is out of the country, so this is kind of like a funeral. We've all shown up, <laughs> We've all shown up to say nice things about him, and he's not here to hear them. So. He did a really great thing uh, supporting both the centers and new writers and honoring us. And so, yay, Neil. Um, I sent him an email with notes what I was going to say so he wouldn't miss the whole thing before he left. Um, I'd like to say a few things, too, about 
why we picked this book, because in my opinion, it was so far ahead of the other contenders. Um, the first thing is the prose is beautiful. And as my nuns in Sacred Heart used to insist, that if you're like Joseph Conrad in writing in a second language, with the beauty and strength that is in this book, it's pretty much a miracle. Um, we also live in a culture where a lot of our native speakers, like little honey Boo Boo and her family, <laughs> are so lost in their native language that they actually need subtitles for us to understand them. So I'm so glad that we found a way to import good English writers to this country. So um, I think the other thing, another point of this book is it's very original. The structure is experimental. I find usually experimental prose has all the emotional feel of watching clock gears mesh. I mean, there's a certain, I don't know, attraction to that, but this one not only puts the book together in a really amazing new way, but it does, it keeps the emotional heart I mean, you're always getting punched with this book. Um, and I think the third thing is just an important theme. Uh, Jim and I were talking, I and mean, we both worked with war vets, and any human who's ever been in a war takes that war with them. And so I think when anybody writes about that with honesty and says the way it happened and what happens to you afterwards, that is consolation to everybody else that went through that. And informative for those of us that didn't have to. So to me, this was a powerful, strong book. And um, I'm so happy that we got to meet the author and that we had a chance to give it one more accolade. So thank you, dear. <laughs>